Ah, Jesus, thank you for a beautiful morning. Um, thank you that at least it feels like fall um, intellectually or maybe existentially, uh, but it's not necessarily actually fall because it's still going to be 104 on Monday. But thank you for the seasons um, that we get to imagine and the beauty of the mountains and the, the gorgeousness of our city. And uh, Father, we, we thank you for sending your son die on the cross for our sins and to deliver us into the kingdom of light and to give us hope. And we come here today, this morning, hoping to hear from you. Uh, and we come here in different places. Some of us are visiting. Some of us, uh, this is our new church. Some of us, uh, we've been here a long time. Some of us, our brains were just trying to figure it all out. and We don't even know what's up or down. We're kind of afraid, but we're happy to be here. Um, we're trying to follow you, and we ask that you would honor that. And give us courage tonight as, and this morning um, to uh, collectively uh, grab onto what's true. Enjoy one another's company. Um, listen for your spirit to speak. And not to hold against each other the ways things are said or the awkwardness or anything like that. And we hold that in your, we offer that to you, Jesus, and ask that in your name. Amen. All right, so. Our morning service, here we are. Um, if you are like, hey, why are we having a morning service? Well, uh, you can look around, there are empty chairs, and that's the whole reason we are having a morning service, is that we want you to get to know the people around you. We want you to have an opportunity to have uh, a deeper and more uh, engaged conversation. And there are some evenings where we have had upwards of 150 people, and like 50 of those are kids under the age of 12, which has made it difficult at times to have conversations with the kids that isn't just yelling, right? Get out of there, stop that, don't throw that person, yeah, that kind of thing. Um, and so the whole purpose of this is to open it up, and you can see it's open, right? There's space for people to come and be part. And so that's what we're excited about. Um, and we're happy that it's in the morning, or at least some of us are happy to be here in the morning. Um, some of us are, that's just a whole, this is the first morning service in like 18 years of the village. So that's, uh, some of us are a little disoriented still. But I would like to start tonight by, or this morning, and I'm going to say tonight a lot because I'm used to that. Um, I'm going to start this morning by telling you a story. I, uh, recently my son started riding the bus, and so he needed a cell phone. Um, so I went to the, you know, my local carrier. I can't say their name because this is going on the internet. So uh, I went there and I met the salesman and I told him, look, I need to add a phone. Plus, I'm paying a lot. I'd like a different plan. And he was the nicest salesman. He, in fact, got my son on my plan, got me lots of little perks and saved me $100. I, I think he was my lost uncle. That's what I felt like when I left. I was like, this is the greatest. This is awesome. And so I got my first bill, and I didn't really look at the bill that much. It was what he said it was going to be. I think it was like $10 more, and I figured, oh, that's, you know, all the taxes and charges that they like to charge you with these days. So I was like, this is great. This is awesome. Things are good. I get the bill the next time. And when I get the bill the next time, uh, it is twice as much as the previous bill. And on top of that, it's almost twice as much as my old bill. And I start freaking out. I'm like, oh my gosh, what happened? So I get on this carrier's uh, website and I log in and I get to their chat and I start, you know, typing furiously. And finally the computer on the other end decides that I need to talk to a human because it can't help me. And so I finally get a human and we're talking and we're going back and forth and She's like, I don't know what they were telling you, because there's no way that you can have this deal. This deal is not offered to anybody. Um, and so, and so, but I'm like, this is what he said, and this is how it works, and I'm going back and forth, and, and she's like, no, 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 that's not how this works. And I'm starting to get really angry, and finally, she says, well, look, here's what I can do for you. I can get your son's line on your plan, but you're going to pay exactly what you were paying before. So your old plan, you're going to lose those fun perks that he gave you, and we'll get this other line. So we'll get it down, but that's the best I can do for you. 
I'm like, okay, well, I guess that's the best you can do for me. So I log off and I'm so furious, like I'm shaking. And I don't know if you know that experience where, where like you have been taken advantage of and you feel like injustice or injustice or whatever that justice word is, has happened and you need to pay that person back. Like they need to pay for what they did to you. Um, because you, um, you can't get this feeling to go away. You can't get it to go away. And you feel like you feel powerless. Right? You just feel powerless. Now, in some ways, um, it's more than you feel powerless. You kind of feel like a god who's been spited by your carrier's um, you know, service. Like your peons have messed things up for you, right? I just want to read to you um, quickly a little narrative here out of Genesis in the very beginning. So God created the world and... When he spoke it into existence, it doesn't matter how you imagine that to be, seven days or a very long time, he spoke it into existence and he placed mankind, male and female, into it. And he tells them, look, like you can do whatever you want. You can eat, you can build, you can hang out, you can have fun, we're going to walk at night and, the, and we're going to just be, it's gonna be good, but there's a tree in the middle, tree of knowledge of good and evil, don't eat from it, right? Well, that's because love at some level needs boundaries, right? Think about it with your kids. Like if you have no boundaries with your kids, you have no friendship with them, right? Because they're wild and you've got no friends because all you're doing is screaming at them, right? So you need boundaries. All relationship needs boundaries. God gives us at least one in the beginning. Don't eat from this tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So Eve, the first woman, is staring at the tree. And we're going to pick our story up there. It says, now, the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat from the fruit, from the fruit, fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it or you will die. You will not surely die, the serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and here's the key, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. You will be like God, knowing good and evil. Well, there I was, sitting at my computer, after talking to the internet carrier, of my phone service, and I was like God. I wanted wrath to be poured out for the injustice that I felt. Right? I was God. I was God. So when um, when we went through this series on Habakkuk, Mark Crawford was running around kind of crazy doing sound and all. He wrote a, a, a song that we sing called The Lament of Habakkuk. And in that lament, in, and Habakkuk's an ancient prophet in the Old Testament, in that lament he kind of summarizes Habakkuk and God's accusation against Israel. And it's this, he says, We build idols, we build statues, we build altars before your eyes. We praise our works, we praise ourselves, we praise our own name. My, oh, my. You see, what's happened is God put us in a good place, gave us boundaries, and we decided that we should be God and that we should build altars and that we should praise ourselves and that we should be the center and that everyone else should revolve around us. Right? Everyone needs to revolve around you and me. Right? Or just me, not you. Um, most of the time. Now, Romans, we're actually a small group. Romans 6.23. Who knows Romans 6.23? Throw it out here. I know I've got some people. It starts with four. For the wages. Eternal life. 
Christ Jesus our Lord. Very good. Some of you got it. Some of you remember that verse. All right. So, for the wages of sin is death. Right? This is what Paul in the New Testament is trying to tell the Romans. The wages, the cost of sin is death. Right? The cost of being God and taking God away from where he's supposed to be in our life is death. There are two kinds of death that sin produces. Right? One is that you're going to die. I hope that's not a surprise to any of you. Right? I don't know it ruins your day, but you're going to die. Eventually. Hopefully you all have long lives, but you're going to die physically. But the other way that you and I die is right now. And what it is, is that moment when I was sitting at the computer and I felt powerless. Right? That feeling inside of me is a consequence of death. The anger I felt and the wrath that I wanted to pour out is a consequence of death. Right? My fear and anxiety that somehow I can't live life with an extra, without an extra hundred dollars because my daughter just started driving and I got to pay her insurance is death. Right? Because all of a sudden the responsibilities of being God is a burden. Right? The wages of sin is death. You know, so what happens is I had my idol which was me, that built altars for me. So anyway, you end up with the bur- this burden, and really all of it is, is all those things of you trying to be God. The wages of sin is death. It's heavy. And my son came in, and I had my hands in my, you know, I faced my hands, and he's like, wants to ask me a question, and then he looks at me, and he says, what's wrong? And I'm like, rah, 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 rah. I don't want to talk about it. <laughs> don't talk to me right now. Go away. Right? See, it, it begins to just pour out its wickedness, the burden of death. So the wages of sin is death. But it says that the gift of God is eternal life. Right? Here, here's what's fascinating about Christianity is that Christianity is built in boundaries. Right? I am flesh and blood. I can't be anywhere else but right here. When I die, this body will leave. But Christians believe, people who follow Jesus, that we will be resurrected. But you will not be resurrected in some ethereal body. You will actually be limited by your body. Now, it may have different limitations than we have now, but you're going to be limited. But what's cool about that is that it is eternal life, right? The gift of God is eternal life. Where does eternal life come from? Well, it comes from God. So eternal life, then is a freedom now and in the future from physical death because I'm no longer bound by it. And it's also I'm free from this or in the process of being free from that. But here's the key to that, the last part of that verse, through Christ Jesus our Lord. The longer I am a follower of of Jesus, the more that phrase just fascinates me. Like, I just like to say it over and over again. Christ Jesus our Lord. Because Christ means king, and Lord means king, right? It's Jesus is the primal authority. He's it, right? So eternal life comes through Jesus, who is the ruler of all things. So we're in this series that we're just kicking off that we decided we don't have a name for it. So it's a series that's going to spend three weeks on what the gospel is, and six weeks on what the values of the village are. We thought, hey, let's just do that since we're switching to two services and we're starting a new thing, and let's talk about the gospel. So at the village, for those of you who haven't been here, when we talk about the gospel, we say the gospel is three things. Let's see how many of you remember what they are. First thing of the gospel is story. Right. Gospel means victories of Christ, but first thing is story. Second thing is identity. Third thing, it's kingdom. So when we say gospel, and uh, Emily was right, it actually means, the little word means the victories of Christ or the good news of Christ. But we say it's Jesus' story embraced. When we embrace Jesus' story, we get an identity. Out of his story and his identity, we go out and live a new life in the kingdom of God. Right. So tonight, we're just going to talk about the story of Jesus and the power that it has in our life. Because part of embracing the gospel is understanding exactly what Jesus does in our life and who he is. 
Because if he's the one who gives us eternal life and rescues us from our sins, how do we embrace that? So the first thing I want to do, and what I would suggest for you to do, is begin to immerse yourself in the four Gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, right? You have to get into those. That's the beginning of the New Testament. So I just want to dive down into one little story of Jesus for a moment to get us started in what it looks like to step in to his story, okay? Now, we will get to the major events of Jesus' story, but I want to just touch on a little bit of his life. So, Gospel of John, chapter 6, verse 67. What's happened here is Jesus has said a bunch of hard things, things that people don't like to hear, and they've left. And here's what's a cool picture of Jesus, who actually, he's not insecure, but he is like, wow, where's my ministry going? All the crowds have left. And so he turns to his disciples and he says, you do not want to leave me too, do you? Jesus asked the twelve. Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We believe and know that you are the Holy One of God. The beginning of embracing the story of Jesus, as you, when you hear it, where you and I have to start is with a confession. The question is asked to us over and over again in every situation where there's adversity, where you and I are the center, where we think we're the center of the world, is are you going to leave me too? And part of being a follower of Jesus is making a repeated profession that is, where would we go? You have the words of eternal life. You are the Holy One, right? You're it. Part of being a follower of Jesus is making a profession. So I want to kind of just look at three things that we all can practice in kind of entering the story of Jesus, and I'll try to illustrate them with this story about my cell phone carrier. And I'll help you all deal with your cell phone carriers. That's what this is. Cell phone carrier help group. (laughs) Um, So first, the first one is that you have to make a profession. And you heard read um, to you Romans chapter 10, verses 9 and 10 earlier. Um, And Paul says to the Romans, he says that if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you confess and are saved. When you come on Sunday, one of the things that you're doing is making a confession that Jesus is Lord and beginning to work on your heart to believe. Because the thing is, going out into the world reminds you over and over again that you should be God, not God. That you should be the one who's figuring it out. Coming on Sunday, in the morning or the evening, with a community who's professing it is the practice of restoring your belief and making known to people around you with them that you believe that God, or that Jesus has the words of life, right? We do that together to strengthen ourselves. It is a practice and it is the entrance in to the kingdom of God. But it's not just the thing you say once, it's the thing you say over and over again with your community to affirm the belief. Right? Because if you go back to the early story of Eve staring at the tree, she is already confused about what God has said to her. And things have already gotten mixed up and she's misquoting God because she's there isn't this recitation. There isn't an affirmation with one another of what you believe. Right? So we're called to enter first that way, to make that profession. Second thing is that you and I are called then to let go. Right? We're called to let go. The practice of following Jesus calls us to let go, entering into his story. So Luke chapter 11, verse 11 Actually, we'll start in verse 9. Jesus says this. Actually, we'll start in verse 9. 
Yeah, we'll start in verse 9. So I say to you, ask, and it will be given you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks, receives. He who seeks, finds. And to him who knocks, the door will be opened. Which of you fathers, if your son asks for a fish, will give him a snake instead? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Now first, this is an amazing passage because what he's saying is that when you and I make a profession that Jesus is Lord, that the Spirit of God is given to us. And that's pretty cool. But even more, but I think interesting in this, this passage is that Jesus says that you and I, who are evil, give good things, right? So why wouldn't the God who's really good give us what we need so, so look how this works. When I'm sitting there going crazy, trying to make this lady on the other line give me what I want, right? and I believe that what I'm saying is, God, make this work. I need $100. And you know what Jesus said? He said, no, you don't need an extra $100. But I seek and I knock and I want $100. But what does Jesus say here? And this is why I say the key is to let go. He says, like, but Eric, I gave you the Holy Spirit. There's a disparity here. A hundred dollars, the Holy Spirit, right? He, but but that's but I'm like no. But I need to pay for my car insurance for my daughter. No, I will take care of you. I gave you the Holy Spirit. Isn't that enough? No, I need to pay for my car insurance. Not enough. Do you see that what happens is when we enter into the story of Jesus, things start getting reoriented very quickly because we're playing out the tape in our story. I need this. Things need to work out this way for me. I need to feel this way. People who are unjust to me need to pay a price. And Jesus is like, no, no, no. I will provide everything you need. I gave you the Holy Spirit. I've already done it. right? And and so in some ways, that reorientation, letting go, is me saying, okay, the Spirit of God, of the entire, you know, God, God, there's no entire. It's just God. Like, His Spirit is standing with me now. His Spirit was here when I was here. His Spirit's with you when you're at home. He's, when you have the Spirit of the living God with you, do you need anything else? And will not that God of the universe, which I love to say, because God of the universe is an awesome way of describing God, um, when would he not give you what you actually need? Maybe not feel like what you need. So part of being a disciple is being willing to let go. So for me, and the cell phone is, okay, Eric, it's not really important to have the Holy Spirit. And, and what, what happens is, like, it changes my perspective. I'm going to be okay paying an extra hundred bucks. I'm going to be fine, right? The Holy Spirit, I have the Holy Spirit. I need to let go. I've made my profession as to where I stand. So the, the third thing, then, And there are a lot of ways of being a disciple, but I just came up with three tonight or today for us to think through, is that God, if we're going to enter into Jesus' story, he asks us to rest. He invites us into rest. Uh, I want to quickly read to you Mark um, chapter 6. The disciples had gone out and done a whole bunch of ministry for Jesus with Jesus. They were out healing people, casting out demons, doing all that kind of stuff. And in the beginning of Mark um, 6, verse 30, it says, the apostles gathered around Jesus and reported to him all they had done and taught. Then, because so many people were coming and going, that they did not even have a chance to eat. He said to them, come with me by yourselves to a quiet place and get some rest. So they went away by themselves in a boat to a solitary place. Now, if you know the rest of the story, it was difficult for them to work that all out. They got, you know, people tracked them down. But here they are doing things for Jesus, and things get so crazy that Jesus says, no, you have to come away and rest, right? You need to come away and rest. But what happens is that you and I approach rest very differently. God says that we're supposed to rest once a week, right? A Sabbath day. This is what we usually call Sunday. This is our day of rest. 
But the way that you and I tend to rest is that if we're doing a lot of ministry or we're doing a lot of stuff, which we all like to do, right? We're busy, busy, busy. Good way to rest is Netflix, right? This is a good place of rest. Um, or another good place of rest is a really nice restaurant or just a bag of talkies. Right? That's a good rest. For some of us, rest is actually uh, an, way too many beers, right? Or any other kind of substance, right? We, but we're, rest to us is escape, not rest, right? Because rest is actually relatively awkward. Uh, l- let me explain to you how rest works. So you're busy. Things have been very stressful. You've been talking to the cell phone carrier. You're angry. You want justice. And Jesus says, wow, Eric, that's really tough for you. Um, Why don't you come and rest? No, no, no. That guy, that he was like not, he cheated me. He faked me out. He, He made me have to spend more money. And Jesus says, well, yeah, I was there. I died for him. It's okay. Yeah, so, I need to work this out. And then Jesus says things like, you know, I was born a virgin from a virgin. Ah, I don't, what does that have to do with anything? Well, it's my story. I'd like to tell it to you again. No, I don't want to hear that at all. Like I want to deal with the cell phone carrier and how he cheated me. And now there's, that's, it's a big conspiracy. Uh, well, do you know that I rose again from the dead? Yes. I say that a lot up front, tell people that a lot. Do you under, but do you see, rest is actually becoming so connected to God's story that the way other people interact with me and the way I experience the world is changed because it's not my burden anymore because I'm not the God. What God is saying is, I will bear the burden of you being cheated and you can join me in that a little bit. That's the invitation. But what he asks... he. We come and say, we come to the Bible and we say, and to Jesus, we say, am I okay? What am I going to do about these things? How do I solve these problems? How do I take care of my kids? And he says, well, you know, I was walking along and I told this parable about throwing some seed. He's not going to directly answer your question because he wants you to come be part of his story and centered on him because then it changes the way that you understand other people, you understand your own self, and it actually allows you to rest. Right, right in the place that you are. Because what happens if I live in God's story, then I begin to pray for the sale, the, so that salesman. I care about his story and not what he's done to me. Right? I begin to know that I'm safe and don't need to worry about what my financial situation will be because I have the Spirit of God with me. Right? This It changes the way that you and I understand things. Right? So, my invitation tonight, and I don't, somebody have time? Not used to the morning. 11 a.m., oh my goodness. Um, My invitation is first that you kind of take seriously, ask the question, am I really making a profession that you believe that Jesus is God, that he died on the cross for your sins, that he rose from the dead, and that his spirit is with you? Is that something that you're willing to make? Is it something that you repeatedly do? Is it something because this is an allegiance thing? We're part of a kingdom, and we'll get to that. We're priests. We make a profession of who we are. Are you willing to do that? Can you do that? Is it part of your life? Number two, are you willing to let go? Like, are you willing to let go of being God? Because here's a good way of figuring out how your you know what your idols, your idolatry is, and what you are kind of where you think you're God. Think about the different things in your life and, and that you really value and think, my life has to have these. And then God is like, no, they don't. And then you get angry. Well, there's where your idolatry is, right? And, and it's very subtle. It's not usually big. Like For me, if you think about the cell phone carrier, it's like, I have to be treated fairly. That's my demand. If you do not treat me fairly, I will punish you. right? Or if you treat any of my friends unfairly, I will punish you. I will remove a lot of fear in my life to go punish you if you hurt me or someone else. Like, I'm, that's the kind of person I am. Well, that got violated and I felt powerless. See? So I got to let go of being God. 
if I'm going to be able to rest, if I'm not going to carry around the burden of anxiety and fear and powerlessness. So third, I would, I would ask you to think about, okay, well, where is God asking me to rest? Where is he giving me the answer I don't want? Where is he not really answering the question I keep asking? In that spot, really the invitation is Jesus saying, you know, come rest. Let's take a deep breath. Let's live in my story. Let's live in what I'm doing, not in what you're doing. It's a very good question to ask. So the first part of the gospel is story. And I don't want you to mistake that, yes, Jesus, the four gospels tell Jesus' story in a really big amount. But you can boil it down to Jesus was born of a virgin. He lived a life you and I can't live, died on the cross for your sins, rose from the dead, and he's coming back to make all things new. We get to practice some of that with him until he returns. I have some time for questions in the morning. Anybody have any thoughts, questions, reflections? Yes, sir. There is a mic you can target to, but there are no mics here today. Um, So thank you for inviting me into rest. However, your cell phone carrier should not be taking advantage of you. (laughs) And our world should not be riddled with disease and injustice and war. And um, in Jesus' story, he takes matters into his own hands to establish justice. So how do we discern the difference between following Jesus in his fight for justice and his invitation into rest? Uh, Well, I would say that Jesus's fight for justice is always built around his own suffering, right? His biggest movement to strike against death and give us eternal life was to die and suffer at the hands of the Romans and to have his God tell him turn his back on him, his father to abandon him. So I would say that that at least is the beginning model for how you go about that. Be my thought. Any other questions? Comments? Invitations? So I think a lot about Gethsemane where Jesus says, I don't want to do this. And he's making this claim that says, in the world as it ought to be, I would not have to die. And I don't want to die. I'd rather not. But, not my will, but yours. And then he lives out submission. And I think that's the same thing for us. We can say, this is unjust. It should not have happened. And I'm not the one who gets to decide whether this gets fixed or not. And I think I can still, I'm still going to go back to my carrier and offer vulnerability, but I'm, and, and, and I'm not going to demand justice, though. I think it's First Peter 2. I've been thinking about so much different than the way we do things in the world to pray for our enemies and do good to those who, and that was really powerful what you said about being willing to die rather than demand justice. You weren't serious about us going out and doing Netflix and talkies, or can we do that? What's that? <clears throat> what if we like doing the Netflix talkies and uh, restaurants? <laughs> well, I, I think you consider why you're doing that. <laughs> At least Netflix and talkies together. But. I also think that when we deal with justice, um, Jesus' fight often is justice for others. It's not justice for himself, because justice for himself means he doesn't go to the cross. He stands up and says, no, I shouldn't have to do this, and doesn't do it. That would be just, but he fights for justice for others. And I think whenever I'm tempted to fight for justice, it's usually I want justice for myself. And then I remember in that moment, go fight for justice for someone else. Yeah, I like that. That's good. Yep, behind you. Yep. So what I hear you saying is Sabbath rest is seven days a week. Yes. 
And so, so we're being invited into that continually. Yes. But we do set aside one day to gather with believers yes. for that initial. Is that way? So it's sort of redefining Sabbath for me. In a little way, yeah, yeah. But I, I completely thought about work that out. That's yes. I would agree. So I mean, w- we come together once a week for two hours or four hours if you're going to go to both services, and then maybe a couple more hours if you're in a pilgrim group, and maybe you meet one on one with somebody. But like, why can't it just be twenty four seven? You know, it, that's the actual. I mean, how do we how do we practice that when you're not? Because this is easy right here when there's believers and you're speaking the truth, and I can go right to you know, hear it from you, but then tomorrow morning and then tomorrow evening, like how do we practice this throughout the week and enter into that rest apart from a structured church service? Well, I think next week when we talk about identity, that's what we're going to talk about. So, okay. Hopefully you'll come next week and find out about it. (laughs) It's how you practice that in a daily way, the identity given to you. So we'll we'll talk about that. I think I'm probably out of time now. So let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you so much for this community. I pray the, for the food that we'll eat soon and uh, that you bless that. I pray over um, the offering and I pray over all that um, the conversations that we'll have this morning, that you would be present in them. And I ask that in your holy name. Amen.